Get out my way, dialer carpet. <laughs> I want to test the instant power. For the next 48 hours, I'm going to be trading this for this, which is the brand new Peugeot E3008. Now, I'm sure one of the first things you'll notice and the elephant in the room, potentially quite literally, is the fact that it is quite big. It's massive. One, two, three, four, four and a half meters long by probably two and a bit wide. It is certainly going to fill a modern parking space. Saying that though, although big, it doesn't feel like a barge. And as a modern SUV, it comes with quite a few things that you would expect. Massive 20 inch wheels as standard. The front end looks quite menacing. You've got a big sweeping bonnet and then almost an abrupt stop. It doesn't, however, look like the front end of a modern fridge freezer. This grill, well, I've been driving it sensibly this morning and it's already covered in flies. It's not something I would have to want to clean all in there. And look at the size of this badge on the front. It's massive. The front end though, I don't dislike it. One thing I do want to point out to you is this gloss black trim and paintwork all along the bottom here in the wheel arches. That is as standard on the EV model. If you were to buy one of the other models of this, the mild hybrid version and some more that are coming soon, they come in a scratchy grey plastic. I like that. The 3008 is not a new car. The first model released in 2015, the second model available right up until the end of 2023. 2024 then, the new model, which is this. And one thing I have noticed in comparison to the two is this sloping roof at the back. But does that mean I get less boot space? Well, the answer to that is no. There is ample boot space in the back here and minimal loss of space, if any, in comparison to the previous model. One thing you do get, which is impressive, is four, yes, four ways of opening the boot. There's a button on the center console that you can press as part of the navigation system. There are buttons under here that you can press. You can use the key or do the hokey cokey and wave your foot underneath and it opens the boot. Cool. The boot space is massive. I can get in here, the inspector can get in here, and Mrs. John Coupland can get in here with me too. You can lift this boot liner up and across to give you flush with the back here, or give yourself some more space. Okay, another six inches there. Your boot floor uh, underneath houses your charging cables or whatever else you want to put in there. But how do you keep that up in place? Oh, cool. I've been provided with a standard charging cable for use at most outlets in the UK and also a three pin one. So I can plug it up here at home without having a proper charge box. That does take longer but it is a nice portable charging box for the car. In the back, you've also got fold down seats of 40, 40, 20. Folding the rear seats down is nice and easy. And for the benefit of this, I'm also going to take out the parcel shelf, which should just unclip on both sides and come straight out. Ready for van mode. And I like to store the parcel shelf in there. Enough space for me to probably lay down. Yup. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want to spend much time laid in the back there, but it does demonstrate to you just how much space there really is in the rear of this car. So far, so good. If I was to put the floor down, I'd get even further, wouldn't I? Inside, well, Yes, it is a bit of a spaceship, but there is a lot of room in here. Me being six foot four, seven inches between my head and the roof lining. And actually, I've not got my seat all the way back. 
It feels nice in here. This SA is the GT spec. So it is the top of the range spec, which does give you a little bit of a different trim in here, including this sort of Alicantra feel bucket seats with the Peugeot logo embossed into the headrest. I'll have a look at all the features in the next 24 hours, but at the moment it's nice. And actually in the back with the black headlining, feels like you're in the cinema. Now, one of the main gripes I had with the Peugeot 308 when I tested it recently was getting in the back. The roof sort of sloped down here and me as a big guy had to really duck and squeeze myself in. However, in this one, let's test the back seats. So I've got the seat in my driving position and it is not all the way back. I can't get in here comfortably at the back. I would have to ask the driver to pull their seat forward. There is physically not enough room for me to be comfortable. I've got my legs spread open here and with the door shut, they're actually now wedged against that door console. Headroom, not too bad. If I was to sit up straight, yeah, my head would be touching the ceiling here. And at the moment, the headrest is digging into my shoulders. If somebody large is driving, somebody the same size as me is driving, being a passenger in the back behind them is not a comfortable place to be. Don't get me wrong, kids, get them in the back. Small people, get them in the back. And you can't get a John in here very well. That's disappointing. And you can see there with the driver's seat right back, the amount of space you actually do get. What's that, four inches? You get more space on a Ryanair flight. However, looking on the bright side, should I find myself cramped in the back, at least I get my own cup holder, climate control, USB sockets and 12 volt power supply in the rear here. The rear feels a bit of an afterthought. So I'm clearly not going to want to be a passenger in the back for long, if at all, but how about being a passenger in the passenger seat in the front. Well, I've got my seat all the way back and actually I can recline and get my legs pretty much straight in the front here. There is a lot of space and actually, I suppose if I was with a friend, there'd be plenty of room now behind me as a passenger, but probably not as a driver. The driving position is certainly unusual in comparison, but I don't know about you, if I'm sat next to a driver, I want to be at the same seating height as them, seating level as them. I don't want to be sat in the footwell here, whilst Mrs. John Cooper sat all the way back there. Joking apart, there is lots of space in the passenger seat here. The glove box is, uh, is interesting. You've got a couple of areas here to put your bits and pieces in. It feels a bit cheap. And in here, we've got the usual. We've got a mirror with lights in. I can look at the teeth, make sure I'm all ready for a big night out. Sunglasses holder. It's on a spring-loaded clip. Mm. Touch lights. And we've got an SOS button here. I better not press that. That's all well and good, John, but what's under the bonnet, I hear you cry? Let me show you. It's powered by this, a 73 kilowatt battery, producing 210 horsepower, and as Peugeot claim, a range of 326 miles from a full charge. That is at the moment, because later this year, they're intending on releasing a higher capacity vehicle with over 400 miles of range. As we all know, predicted range versus actual range, even in a petrol or diesel engine, can be two different things and include factors such as road and what you're using in the cabin. If I've got the aircon on, if I've got the sound system pumping and using all the whistles and bells, of course you're not going to get 326 miles out of it. However, this does come with regenerative braking technology, which means in layman's terms, it actually adds electric miles back into the system by using the braking to generate more power. How good it is, time will tell. 
I have driven the E208, not on the channel, and predicted miles versus actual miles was actually quite poor. For example, I did a 20 mile round trip and lost 70 miles on my range. Don't get me wrong, it was a hot day, I had the aircon on, I had the radio on, but that's a big difference, 50 miles, isn't it? So far, so good then. And if you're still with me, then clearly you can get over the fact that the Peugeot is massive. It is huge. You can get over the fact that it's probably going to be difficult to park without having that 360 camera optional extra pack. And you can probably get over the fact that you're not going to be getting 326 miles out of a full charge out of it. You'd be happy with 280, right? I know I would. Oh, I haven't told you the price yet. 51 grand. Yes, I'm glad that I was sat down too when I first heard that price. 51,000 pounds for a Peugeot made me think. But then I had a sit down, I had a look and I thought subjectively about this. And up until relatively recently, to buy an EV with a predicted promised range of over 300 miles, well, you'd have probably been paying double that. Now, I'm not gonna spend hours and hours in this video going through the sales brochure. It is available as a PDF from the Peugeot website, and you can spend as much time as you want looking at technical specification, prices, and specking your car. However, there are a few things that this car has got that I want to share with you that I like. I actually really quite like this, and Peugeot call it a panoramic eye cockpit. The eye cockpit is a 21 inch HD panoramic curved display which incorporates instrument panels and touch screens with three colour screens to choose from. It really is very easy to use. You press media and you can see which radio station is playing. You press navigation and you can select where you want to go. Two touch screens here. This part is not touch screen. At first, I found it quite distracting. However, after driving the car for about 100 miles, I quite like it. Oh, and by the way, did I tell you you can change the colour of the ambient lighting? The driver's armrest opens up easily and gives you lots of extra storage. But hang on a minute, that storage space is cold. The air conditioning filters into this cubby hole in here. It's almost like a built-in cool box. And if you want to charge your smartphone whilst driving, stick it on this plate. Not only is it secure, but it's a wireless charger too. It could be the most economical, beautiful car in the universe. It could be cheap and cheerful and full of the best gadgets in the world. But if it drove like a tin of beans on wheels, you probably still wouldn't buy one, would you? Let's take it for a spin. So I'm in the car ready for the test drive. I've actually just dropped Mrs. John Coupland off to work. And in this test drive, I'm gonna do a mixture of in-town driving and fast road driving. I'm not going to be heading on a dual carriageway or a motorway, sadly, but um, hopefully it should give you a little bit of a taste of what it is about. Stop start technology, and you've got button press engine start. Let's turn Vernon K down. Sorry, Vernon K. It is almost time for 10 to the top. I have got the aircon on. I will be using the navigation system and uh, some of the whistles and bells. 75% currently is my battery and it's telling me I'm going to get a range of 229 miles. A separate range test is coming to the channel. Um, but yeah, let's go. One thing I've noticed already, just by driving this car around, I've driven it sort of nearly 100 miles in the past day or two, people stop and look at it. Whether or not they have an invested interest in the new E2008, or they think, crikey, that's a big old modern SUV. It could just be that people are checking out the brand new car. It's obviously got a 24 plate on there, but I was overhearing a conversation from somebody who was driving a modern electric MG yesterday. She turned to her friend and said, oh, there's the new electric Peugeot. So people are noticing it. It sounds like a French car when you use the indicator, but it is quiet in the cabin. I'm doing 25 miles an hour through the town centre at the moment. We're going to go over quite a few speed bumps in a minute. It is sort of stealthy, and actually I obviously haven't been outside the car 
when it's been moving to know what the road noise is like and the ambient noise, but it doesn't have speakers in it that makes it sound like a V6 under the bonnet, which is a good start. It'll be interesting to see what it's like over the speed bumps. It is a big car and has got quite a long wheelbase, but the curb weight is quite big. It is quite a heavy car, so much so that it is heavier than a Series 1 Range Rover. It's also bigger. More speed bumps. And there's a little bit of noise from the suspension, but it's not rattling my fillings out. Let me show you a feature. OK Peugeot. Turn aircon off. And there it goes. It's off. I don't have to fiddle about with any buttons. It has got voice activating services called OK Peugeot. Now I've said it, it's going to want me to do something. Cancel. <laughs> but it is a nice little feature that. One thing about the OK Peugeot system is it has a microphone here and it has a microphone here, so it knows who is telling it to do what. So if Mrs John Coupland was to be telling it to turn the aircon down on her side, it wouldn't affect my side. Let's try and use the cruise control. That was easy to set. You just press OK. I can feel the lane assist trying to keep me in my lane and it is an unusual feeling if you're not used to it. It is sort of fighting against me a little bit. It's not driverless, don't get me wrong, you can't drive this without your hands on the steering wheel, but if you needed to for just a second, that split second, for whatever reason, it would probably keep you in your lane okay. So town driving, and I've been driving for a few miles now, and I'm still on 75% battery. I haven't charged this up overnight. Of course, it's an automatic, which means that I am getting used to, again, one pedal driving. But because I drive a smart car normally, it's the same sort of thing. I'm going to take the car out towards open roads, out into the Lincolnshire countryside. And if you've watched the channel before, you know that I often throw some cars like this down round the Lincolnshire back roads. I'm going to go around this roundabout. The turning circle is tight, it's nice that. That's a lovely turning circle and the uh, electric power steering doing a grand job. Easy to use that. A bit of a bone of contention on these modern Peugeots is the small squat steering wheel and actually I quite like it. Mrs John Cooten got in and described it as dinky. However, due to the fact of how I'm sitting and how I've got the steering wheel positioned, it actually covers half of the binnacle, half of the eye cockpit. I've got it as far down as I could have it comfortably. If I was to have it up high, where I would normally have my steering wheel, I can't see most of it. That's not just this car either. I've found that with a lot of modern Peugeots. I've put the steering wheel back down and it's not uncomfortable, but it's not how I would be having it. That's a shame because, well, it covers my range. It covers important things, things I want to be looking at. I'm going to have to do that every time I want to see it. That's a shame. Things the car has that I'm not going to be testing today, owing to the fact it's 27 degrees outside, include heated seats in the passenger and the driver's seat. That's not for the rear, sadly. It is only for the front. No heated steering wheel, though. The car comes with three driving modes, which you can change by using a little nub here. You can change it to eco mode, which changes my range to 236 miles from 225. Or I can change it to sport mode, which has made a bit of a difference there, actually. It's taken my driving range, though, down to 213 miles. One thing I would say is changing from normal to sport, losing an estimated range of 10 miles, I might try it in sport mode for a bit. Whoa, crikey! <laughs> that would get away with me if I wasn't used to what I'm doing. That's some nice acceleration. 
and it is direct acceleration. We aren't waiting for anything, and that is one of the best things about EVs that I have found. That instant power. Instant power! <laughs> Get out my way, dialer carpet! I want to test the instant power. You can alter the resistance of the regenerative braking by using some flappy paddles this side of the steering wheel, and you can really feel that it applies that braking power more. It feels like someone is doing an emergency stop or that you've got uh, a brake stuck on somewhere at full pelt. I've been driving it on, I don't know, the first setting, and it seems to be more enjoyable. I'm doing a standing start to 60. I am in sport mode. I have got 211 miles range on the clock and I'm on a 60 mile an hour road. Ready? Sport mode! <laughs> Instant power and I'm at 60. There. Uh, count the seconds. Let's do that again. A standing start. I'm going to set my cruise control to 60. And I'm going to let the car do the work this time. Go! It's going to take me up to 60 gradually. 6, 8, 11, 13, 16, 18, 21, 26, 28, 30, 33, 36, 38, 40, 45, 47, 50, 52, 56, 58, 60. <laughs> From a standing start. Let's go. Pedal to the metal. 14, 17, 19, 25, 30, 33, 39, 40, 47, 49, 50, 57, 60. There we are. Not to 60 in relatively low uh, seconds there. I need to find out the actual figure. Not to 60 is fast, especially in sport mode. Ho, 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 ho. But it doesn't feel fast. It feels comfortable. At 60 miles an hour on these Lincolnshire bumpy old riverbank back roads, there's a bit of wind noise. There is some wind noise coming from this window. It could be due to the fact that it doesn't have window seals on display at the top there. It could just be the crosswind of the day. It is quite a windy day. There's a bit of road noise, but there's no engine noise, obviously. Oh, it handles well around corners. <laughs> it's not designed to be driven like a lunatic. But you have got instant power for overtaking. And it's safe. The range is holding up nicely. Again, I'm in sport mode and I'm getting about 85% of what it's telling me I should be getting. On average, if I was to be getting the full 326 miles, then I would need to be averaging five kilowatt per mile. And I'm not. At the moment, I'm getting around about 3.8 to 4.1. I am putting it through its paces. We've just done some standing starts and we've done some town driving as well. I'm going to take the car home now via the back roads and we shall see just how well we get on. God, it handles nicely for a heavy old thing. Overall, I'm impressed with how this drives. You would get used to it very quickly. The braking is quite harsh, um, but again, it's a new car. The acceleration is unbelievable, and for somebody that's not used to driving a direct-powered car, <laughs> It's an eye-opener, let's put it that way. Would I be getting 326 miles out of a full charge? No. Do I think I'll be getting 280? Yeah, I think so. And if I drove it like a nun, with none of the uh, bits and pieces on, I would probably get 300 miles out of it, which I think is acceptable. I haven't been able to charge it up, so I can't talk to you about costs of using it out and about. A fast charge 
uh, what's that going to take? Maybe an hour, a slow charge on your uh, unit at home is going to be one thing that you plug in overnight, isn't it? At 30, it's nice. At 40, it's nice. At 60, it's a bit noisy, but it's still nice. <laughs> that wind noise, I could live with that because I'm doing 60 down these Lincolnshire back roads and I'm there like that. The acceleration is fantastic. It's not about going fast everywhere, I understand. It's practical. You can put the dog in the back, you can put the kids in the back, you can put your holiday shopping in the back and your luggage. You can go to Lidl and fill it. You can buy a paddle board from the middle this Thursday and you could get it in the car. It's huge, don't get me wrong. The car is big. It doesn't feel massive on the road, however. I'm not here feeling like I'm going to be hitting everything either side. It feels like I'm driving my van. The ride height is good and the performance on the road seems to be, so far, what Peugeot are relatively telling us that it's going to be. I like this. I like this car a lot. Well, that's it then. That's the end of my time with the Peugeot E3008. Am I sad to be handing back the keys to it? Absolutely I am, because it looked great on the driveway and it's a lovely car to drive. My humble takeaway then on the car is that I think it's reliable, I think that it's beautiful, and I reckon it's lovely and comfy. The downsides are, I think it's quite pricey and I think it's quite big. You're going to find your own way, and if you've come this far, you're clearly probably considering an E3008 as a new car or a replacement car or an addition to your fleet. My advice, go to your local Peugeot garage, take one for a spin, get the keys for 48 hours if you can, give it a good old charge and give it a real world test and see what you personally think to it. It is a lot of money, £51,000, and it is a big deal, so you don't want to do anything rash. Would it be worth waiting to get the higher um, range one later in the year? Maybe, but how much more is that going to be? Anyway, let me know in the comments below if you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. My humble, honest opinion on this little car. I don't get paid for this, so it's not paid content. I'm not being sponsored by Peugeot, which is why I can be open and honest. And I hope that it doesn't come across as an advert. But if you've enjoyed it, thumbs up, please. Let me know in the comments below what you thought. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so, because it will help you tell YouTube that you enjoy the content that we are putting out. Plenty more to come. Until next time, from me and the little Peugeot, au revoir. I hope you enjoyed this latest car review. Let me know in the comments what you thought. I've selected a couple more videos from that sort of thing. Uh, here, you might like those. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already done so to stay up to date with the channel.